Hi there, thanks so much for joining for this event. This is the latest event in the On Philosophy series hosted by The Philosopher. The Philosopher is the world's longest running philosophy magazine. We're delighted to be co-hosting this event with Oxford Public Philosophy, OPP. They are an online platform, a student-run online platform based out of Oxford University. They host an annual journal, discussion groups, podcasts, online materials, and much more. They're an extremely um, exciting organization, a huge amount of energy, asking exactly the kinds of questions that publicly oriented philosophers should be asking about fundamental questions related to philosophy. So please um, log on to their site and have a look at the many different things. Full details will be in the box below. Um, the context of today's event is that OPP recently um, published an online course related to the book Ethics and Insurrection of Pragmatism for the Oppressed, which was published earlier this year by Bloomsbury and is written by one of our speakers today, Lee McBride. So full details of the book will be in the box below, as well as fuller um, details of Lee and his conversation in partner state, Andrea Pitt. So just a brief introduction, Lee McBride is Professor of Philosophy at the College of Worcester, specializing in American philosophy, ethics, political philosophy, and philosophy of race. Andrea Pitts is Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Their research interests include Latin American and US Latinx philosophy, critical philosophy of race, and feminist philosophy. So um, I'm really excited to, to see these two in conversation. They have many, um, many similar research interests. Um, the structure of the conversation will be that Andrea will be asking Lee various questions about how he came to write the book, the way in which he thinks about writing, the way in which he thinks about expressing ideas, and of course the content of the book, which relates to um, the theory of insurrectionist ethics formulated by many thinkers, including um, Leonard Harris. So um, lots of new ideas, lots of new thinkers. I really hope you enjoy it. Thanks for tuning in. Lee, I'm going to invite you just to, to start off a little bit. I want to mention something really that struck me about the opening of your book, um, which was that um, you, you started the book by discussing themes of um, the kind of U.S. nationalism, the American dream, the experiment of U.S. democracy, which are both touchstones within U.S. pragmatism, but also important points of critique for those who have, you know, read against the grain um, of some of those aspirational Anglo-American projects within U.S. pragmatism. And so you also, you start there, but then you bring in the kind of underside of the U.S. project and its own goals, things like systems of oppression, um, uh, you know, racialized slavery and its afterlives, sexism, ableism, heteronormativity, poverty and class struggle, continuing processes of colonization. Um, and then you then again, not just staying in that moment of, of the underside and of the kind of degradation, you also shift as well to the kind of legacies of struggle against those systems of oppression that are part of the American uh, political project. Um, and so I really think that's an interesting kind of constellation of places to start the project. Um, and you also share throughout the book um, kind of personal stories about your own, um, uh, uh, some of the touchstone uh, themes throughout the, the text, like questions of empathy and so on. You kind of touch in different places on, on where you come in personally. So to maybe kick things off to the audience here, um, I was hoping that maybe you could tell us a bit about some of your pathways to this book in particular, some of your motivations for writing it, and maybe how um, this project connects to other things that you've either researched or experienced in your own life. Okay, thank you, uh, Andrea. Uh, so I, I first want to thank everybody, uh, Anthony Morgan, Alice Winham, uh, Professor Pitts here. Um, thank you so much for uh, reading my material. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for putting in the time and effort to pull this together. Um, okay, so the question. Uh, so my own background, um, my dad is African American and came from the South and they moved to Sacramento, California to have a less segregated life. My mother's family came from Arizona, thereabouts, 
and they're Mexican Filipino and they were field workers, um, came to California for work. Um, and so given my background, given where I come from, given how I see the world, some of the American dream didn't seem as glossy and rosy as others. Uh, I learned the theory. I learned how we're supposed to honor and respect certain things. I understand how we came to be this United States. Um, so I was doing this PhD worrying about John Dewey and Alistair McIntyre on morals and political theory, talking about democracy and liberalism. And that's what I ended up writing my dissertation on. Um, but I all, so I can do that sort of work and I can think through these sorts of things the way that we're taught to think about them. But there's always that sort of bit that doesn't get captured or the sort of like you're describing as the underbelly of United States, at very least the United States sort of experience. And, um, so I guess my early ways of trying to, to critique it was to say that we need a new form of liberalism. We need a new form of democracy or something like this. And uh, so Leonard Harris was one of my teachers at Purdue University when I was getting my doctorate. And he was trying, he was in my ear telling me, you know, don't listen to Dewey. Um, we should all be, we should all be doing a revolution. And he just seemed like uh, way, way beyond the pale. Um, and it took a long, long time for me to be able to listen to him and to really get behind and, and think about some of the things he was suggesting. And to be honest, it was not till I had a job, I was uh, tenure track and I got a leave and I got to spend some time just sitting and thinking, reading and thinking, writing. And um, I was invited to give a talk at the University of Oregon, and I decided to write on Leonard Harris's insurrectionist ethics. And so I just spent a whole lot of time, I dove in. And at that point, I realized it's not as what you might call as crazy as it looks. Um, it, it's not just madness. It's actually very, very complex and thoughtful. And once you get into it and you start to wrestle with it, I think you can see the various things, the tools, the ways of considering, the ways of challenging and what needs to be challenged. Um, and so um, I came to this project very, very late. Um, it wasn't like I, I was working with him in grad school on this, no. It, um, so after that, several publications started to happen. I was asked to uh, bring together a symposium on insurrectionist ethics at some point. I started to get little, like one or two articles here or there. And I had a handful of articles that I wanted to publish. And I, so at some point I, I thought I was just gonna bind them together and have them as like a group of essays. And I pitched that to Bloomsbury. And uh, it was a very nice, like, yes, this sounds really good. I like your writing, but you're not gonna just publish those essays like that. You have to rewrite them as a monograph. And so um, I got a book contract to write this book. Around the same time, I also pitched to them, hey, I know Leonard Harris and his works aren't together in a, a reader can we do that sort of thing? And they're like, well, send me a proposal. I got that book contract too. And so, yeah. So I edited that volume with Harris. And so that time working with Harris uh, closely, um, I had to write or, yeah, I was, I had to write like a, an abstract for each of the pieces. And so to understand Harris, what he's up to, and then distill it down to like one page is super tough. But that was one of the most rewarding um, experiences of my life. And I think it also helped me to write my own book. Um, so I don't know if that, that yeah. helped. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a long story. 
that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, also just just for those folks who may be may be catching it, this was this was the reader, a philosophy of struggle um, that that Lee's referring to here, um, which is a core resource for those of us who work on Harris's work for precisely the reasons he mentioned, um, because it compiles and introduces text not only for teaching purposes but for research purposes as well. I mean, it's just it's a really because his work is kind of spread throughout a lot of different. A lot a long span of time and in lots of different venues. So I want to just kind of come back to a question about writing, which I think um, is something when you mentioned the complexity of Harris's writings, um, I also think that that your book is um, really a remarkable um, text in terms of the art of writing. Um, and I want to just talk about pause for a minute on that because I think that's really important specifically when we're thinking about ethics and moral philosophy. Yeah. So I'll just briefly mention, um, I had I, I had a, I went to a graduate program that had um, a, a, a very prominent strand of pragmatism. Um, one of those professors, when I was in graduate school, was offering a course on the art of the moral essay, um, and was you know offering I think the, I think his touchstone work, and it was a he, were people like Bernard Williams, Bertrand Russell, William James, um, maybe Nietzsche was in there. I'm not sure if he was you know kind of going that far. But um, I know that that course was being offered, but I purposely didn't take the course because I, you know, as much as I know that those are those are incredible writers in their own rights, um, there was something for me, it was not answering, those texts were not necessarily answering the questions that I had with respect to being um, also mixed yeah. ethnically, um, yeah. coming from a, a mixed class background and the kind of questions as a queer person, what I wanted to answer and all these things. And so Lee, your book, in fact, was a book that I wish I had had in graduate school when I was studying pragmatism and, and so on, um, not only for its content, but also for the, the, the way that you're writing philosophy. Um, because in a sense, you're writing from, I think, the languages and the stakes, the political stakes of folks who I know. Like, I feel like there are there's questions here that are much more familiar to me. And so the way that you, you really um, reconfigure the study of ethics in the book is through the written style of people like Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Du Bois, Elaine Locke, Harris, of course, but also Toni Morrison and Marie Lagones who in terms of the art of writing are themselves prolific and incredible um, figures within the genre of what we might call a moral essay or, or moral writing. So I really wanted to invite you to maybe say a bit more about your writing process and about um, maybe the audiences you had in mind when you were choosing the style of the book, um, maybe your choice of metaphors, because there's some really mm -hmm. um, beautiful metaphors that that Lee uses throughout, which is, he's drawing from different places, but really now putting to work in a new way in the book. So, for example, Nietzsche's camel, lion and child dynamic or Toni Morrison's read of the shaper and the dragon. I thought that was a really beautiful uh, kind of concluding chapter of the book. And so maybe just to invite you to say a little bit more about your um, your approach to writing as, a, as an art, as a craft, and then maybe a little bit more about the metaphors that you use and how those play a role in your thinking and writing and teaching. Sounds good. Um, so the, the writing thing, um, wow. So thank you. So nice of you to, to, to say things. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I don't, approach it with like in my head I have a style that I'm trying to to, to emulate um, what I would probably say is that I have a lot of internal dialogue and um, what I was able to do in this book was channel some of that and some of it comes out um, and I started to find devices and ways to do it um, and oh uh, one thing I can say is that I, I'm pretty sure that I benefited from having a book contract. I had the book contract in hand and um, that, it, that gives you the freedom. Um, if you're not worried about reviewer number two coming for you. Um, and I had an editor who was defending me. Um, so Liza Thompson at Bloomsbury was great. And uh, I believe there was at least one point where um, someone said, you know, like, was very critical. And um, she's like, you don't have to even respond to that. Um, so that was great, right? So I had support, I had the freedom. Um, but 
I think it was just a happy sort of, I had a bunch of content and the ideas were flowing. And I mean, at some points it felt really good. It was just sort of flowing out of me at some points, not all the points, but, um, and, and it's great when it does happen. Um, and so, so thank you for, for saying um, nice things about the style. Um, so what I'll say about the metaphors, um, so some of these things are th metaphors and allegories that I've had uh, in my head since undergraduate um, school. So in college, I was reading things like, let's see, um, the Stoics and the Skeptics, right? And so there's the stuff about we're all dogs tied to a cart. Like that like is in my head. I couldn't get that out. Um, that was one of the first philosophy courses I ever took was Hellenistic philosophy. And I remember just wrestling with that. Like, I do not want to be a dog tied to a cart. Um, but notice the imagery is so clear and stuck. Um, Sartre's nausea, I read that thing over and over again. Um, and there were certain bits I loved about it. Certain bits, I just think it's silly. But um, I use some of that. Um, Montaigne, Nietzsche. I think I picked up a little bit of Nietzsche when I was studying abroad in Oxford. Um, I studied abroad for a semester. Um, and again, I remember reading that and just think puzzling, like what exactly is that supposed to mean? It's in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Um, and, and Nietzsche's is hard to understand, right? But these images, I think, if they're, if they're done well, if they're beautiful, if they grab you and you have to stop and think about it, reread it again, think about it again, there's something to that. And um, I think at several places in the book, I use images like that. I use the allegory, I use, right? This means something else. And then let's play with that idea. Um, now, I'll say that the Morrison stuff is newer to me, and um, it kind of took me um, off guard. I, I taught a first year seminar, and it was called Philosophy Disenchanted. Uh, it was right around the time I was finishing up the book, and um, we were reading this material, but but back let's back up to the summer the summer before I was sitting around just reading this book and I was read over and over again and this is the book it's called uh the sources of self-regard by Morrison it's an edited volume right before she passed away um and I remember reading Grindel and his mother that's an essay in that book and I remember putting the book down and it's like this is amazing this is beautiful right and I just couldn't get over it just how it's written so well, there's so much packed into it. It's thoughtful, it's philosophical. Um, and I just couldn't get over that. And it was, a, it was an excellent moment when I realized that I have a way to use it in my writing, to, to use some of these ideas to sort of talk about an issue I wanna talk about. And so it's, it's creative work. It's, uh, it's great when I can use ideas and images from other people. Um, part of me just thinks I got lucky. Yeah, I mean, this is, I think I'm also tracking the chat a little bit. And I mean, part of the motivation for this question is also that I think authors like Toni Morrison, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, they understood writing as an aesthetic process that you that mm -hmm. the art of persuasion, the art of yeah. that, that that we can't just be kind of reasoning machines that right. are just reading for the sake of you know just wrote kind of uh, content. And so yeah. I think the art is important here, the aesthetics of the of the letter and the word and so on. I think the sounds are important. Um, so, but let mm -hmm. me pivot a little bit because I know yes. some folks are really hungry for content. So I want to okay. now pivot into a central claim from the book and one that. Um, that really kind of brings us into both the title of this session, um, Philosophy in a Disenchanted Universe, but also I think a really important thread that you, that you develop in the book. Um, so you develop what you describe as a critical strain of ethical naturalism. Yep. Um, and, you, and I'm going to quote from the book here um, uh, for folks who are you know, wanting to get a little snippet. So you say on page 19 that ethical naturalism um, is, is defined in the following way. Um, the heart of the position, you write, quote, the heart of the position 
rests upon an attempt to explain the world and reality within the limits of nature, to limit our theorizing, philosophical investigations and explanations to natural events, entities, and causes, end quote. And you also mentioned on page 23, and you're citing folks like uh, William James, uh, Elaine Locke, John Dewey, Elizabeth Anderson, you say, quote, I'm, you say, I'm not trying to definitively disprove the existence of this or that divinity. I'm not interested in denying anyone's religious experiences or denying the function of faith in purposive action, end quote. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the book really, I think, builds on this idea of coalitions across difference, right? Building patterns of, of struggle against mul multiple forms of oppression and trying to understand what can link those struggles and uh, kind of push for a different understanding, not just of philosophy, but in the kind of infrastructure of the world that we're living in. Um, and I'm curious then, given this commitment to ethical naturalism, how you're um, imagining building bridges with communities who hold non-naturalist commitments. And so I'm thinking about, for example, forms of social cohesion. So you might think of, and I know uh, Leonard Harris, this is a touchstone figure for Harris too, but Edward mm -hmm. Blyden's kind of framing of the destiny of African diasporic peoples yeah. or non-naturalist commitments to views about trickster animals or beings that kind of exist um, with beyond the tenets of the empirical sciences. So we could think of the coyote figure in Diné uh, uh, nations or um, uh, the Elegba or Elegua um, uh, figure um, uh, who is also a trickster figure among Yoruba diasporic religious traditions. So given these non-naturalistic commitments, how might we continue to think about struggle even along those terms? Yeah. So that's an excellent question, and um, it's something I should I should say more about. Um, so one of the one of the insights I think I have in the book is this idea that we get trapped into certain ideas, certain ways of thinking, and if we never leave those categories, if we never question boundaries, we're not going to be able to see any other alternatives. And so a reoccurring theme in the book is this idea of having to break beyond or to go beyond some of these barriers to extend ourselves um, past where we were born or how we were, we were raised or what is seen as customary. Um, and so one of the things that I propose, and this is me saying, and I, and I do this on purpose uh, in chapter one, I say, this is where I start. Right. I start with an amoral universe. I start not assuming that there is teleology or that there is Brahman or that there is um, something that's going to like providence that's going to resolve things in the end, that there isn't a happy resolution necessarily. Um, and so part of my work with the naturalist ethics is to try and do ethics without some of those presuppositions. Uh, I don't want to assume that, that everything's going to be resolved in the end, if not in this life and the next, those sorts of things. And I, I, and I do quote folks who do, and I think Blyden does. Um, what I want to try to do is create an ethics in this world that's that comes to be and passes away that's uh limited as far as what we humans can know about the world um and so part of my questioning of supernatural agencies is the idea that in many cases those supernatural agencies are given as justifications for why things are the way they are they justify a certain notion of fatalism or that things are the way they are because that's the way they're supposed to be. And so my thing is that I don't want to presuppose those sorts of things. I would hope that anyone who was theological in any variety of the ways you could be or believed in supernatural entities are not limiting themselves from exceeding certain boundaries uh, engaging in insurrection sort of activities, because that would be a barrier, right? If you don't even allow yourself to see or think in these ways, then 
that's that's a way that we get trapped. So I think the question also asks, but how do you how do you approach this as a pluralist who could still create community and build coalitions with others? Well, I, I so one of the things I would say is that I totally want to listen to other perspectives. I want to assume that I don't necessarily have the right answers that in some way are like maps onto the, the world. Um, so, I mean, I, I read new, new material and I learn things that I didn't know before. And so I'm open that I might have to change my ontology, that my, con my conception of naturalism might be limited. So, uh, particularly reading Leanne Simpson has changed some of the ways that I think about ontology and what types of beings I should concern myself with. Uh, but so part of the thing that you quoted from me, if you can have supernatural agencies that we work with or that we are somehow in league with in changing the world or sort of creating our, our futures, I, I'm okay with that. And uh, so I'm willing to learn and grow with others and change our traditions as we move forward. Um, but I don't like the folks or the positions, the philosophies or the religions that trap us and don't allow us to go beyond certain types of things. And so I would say the, those that presuppose a teleology or those that presuppose a set end, um, those are the things that I'm really trying to push against. Yeah, that's that's really helpful because that also maybe pushes against it's and I think there's some some interesting comments in the chat and I'll give a shout out to my to another person who I know is involved in some of these dialogues, Dr. Shay Welsh, um, uh, who I think in a sense maybe part of what's at challenge here is also this kind of the tendency to universalize those telos. And yeah. so and maybe that that's also part of the the struggle here is thinking, mm -hmm. okay, if you have like let's say you're a pluralist about nature that might right. also then afford more opportunities for um coalition building you know in in with difference included rather than a kind of universalizing focus on telos or universalizing focus on uh divine destiny or whatever um uh commitments one has to to whatever's conception of the natural they're using um, and so maybe that's that that's the critique of universalism and a critique of a kind of infallibilism that is yeah. the thing that seems to be part of what's the worry there. Am I getting that right? Yeah. Uh, so the word I would use is uh, I tend to reject uh, absolutisms. So the the views that you know that that's the right way that we know that and we can stop now that sort of thing. Um, right. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. So, so then yeah. I'm, you know, kind of thinking through now, um, mm -hmm. and we've got we've got some a little more time here to kind of continue in. Um, uh, I wonder whether we should kind of shift to thinking about some of the the book's more metaphilosophical questions. And so, um, you sure. we've already mentioned here today Leonard Harris's philosophy born of struggle um, and the kind of commitments of an insurrectionist ethics, which, in your words. Um, uh, advocates, um, and this is also, I think, a blend of also uh, Harris's uh, definition of it as well, but yep, insurrectionist yep. ethics as um, advocating for slave insurrections and making advocacy for the oppressed a fundamental meritorious feature of moral agency, which I think is really key, right? That's the mm -hmm. underside push is to say, like, mm -hmm. this is not, you know, a moral philosophy you know, in a in an absolutist way, it's not a yeah. moral philosophy in a way that's now trying to to kind of top down narrate how how uh, people's lives uh, uh, exist, um, yeah. but also now trying to to look at the the morally meritorious features of resisting patterns of harm and patterns of violence and patterns of oppression. And I think, yeah. and he of course brilliantly uses slave insurrections as that kind of. Um, uh, uh, moral crux in in his essay, but I think you've mm -hmm. also kind of expanded both through the the anthology on Harris um, and your symposium and in the book. So I also want to yeah. take a minute to kind of rest on on some of these features of an insurrectionist ethics. Um, so you outline the tenets in the book. I'm not going to work through all of them. They're they're complex, but they do have some I think important features like. Um, mm -hmm. For example, there's some affective or what we might think of like emotional psychological registers to yeah. um, to features of an insurrectionist ethics. 
Now, one of them you note is that the insurrectionist spirit um, is antithetical to, um, to characteristics like submissiveness, self-effacement, um, and complacency. And so you say, quote, those who would fight against misogyny, racism, settler colonialism, or any cognate form of oppression should be confident, demanding, uncompromising, and aggressive, end quote. And so I want to kind of open the question up here for, for thinking through um, your other like, commitments to, to the kind of pluralistic features of social communities. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and you also emphasize the kind of urgency of building coalitions. And so I wanted to ask, like, given these kind of um, emotional or psychological characteristics um, and this demand for building coalitions, what might be some tools to effectively encourage and build this kind of insurrectionist ethos? Like, and I'm thinking specifically also about like future generations. So not just in our teaching, but mm -hmm. if we are so mm -hmm. lucky to have kin relations with children and young people, yeah. how would we kind of build those relations for young people and, and, and or even, you know, are the elders in our life who are also, you know, we're in dialogue with yeah. and always in learning with. So how sure. could we do this in these various social spaces to try to take up some of these core insurrectionist uh, tenants, um, mm -hmm. and then maybe foster that that broader insurrectionist future. Yeah, so good question. Um, so, so one of the things I'll just touch on before I, I dig into this is the, the idea that um, a, a lot of things that we hold on to the conceptual sort of mechanisms that we use day to day, much of it um, will fall behind, right? It's in the background and we don't think about it too often. And so one of the things that Harris talks about and I talk about um, are the intervening background assumptions that in many cases dictate lots of things, lots of values and norms that we live by that we don't question, we don't think about. Um, and if we don't criticize, if we don't from time to time assess those and reassess those, um, we could be allowing all kinds of things to go on. And so um, Harris has this uh, really troubling um, simile that he does um, about um, Dr. Dick. And um, that one blew me away. Um, if you're talking about morals and how we move from a pr principle to applying that principle in day-to-day -day sort of activities, like this particular act, I'm going to use this principle to tell me that I should do X, um, that we could be operating in line with these types of principles, moral principles, and be enacting white supremacy or things that are in line with slavery. Um, and that blew my mind. And it might seem counterintuitive or it might seem like, come on, it can't be. But if you go back and you read some of these um, people at the time period, that's exactly what they thought they were doing. And, um, and so part of this whole story is to have to stop ourselves from time to time and think about our intervening background assumptions and to reassess where we start and the things we postulate. Um, okay, so your question then, um, you asked about how do we build insurrectionist sort of character traits or vision into the next generations or into children? How do we build communities? And I think it does sound paradoxical to say, we wanna build communities of trust and love and make sure that they have an insurrectionist spirit. <laughs> but that's exactly it. Uh, we do, or at least I want them. Um, so I guess the first step, according to me, is that you have to make it so that people feel that it's possible to do this sort of thing, that it's not beyond the pale, that it's not crazy to do such things or to even think them. And if you think back to my own story that I told you, in graduate school, I couldn't listen to Leonard Harris at the time. I thought revolution was never a possibility. I thought insurrection was mad, right? And so 
that's in my own life. I've had that sort of moment where I exceeded a boundary, right? That at the time in graduate school, I couldn't even listen to it. I couldn't even see that as a possibility. To, to get to the point, right? You have to read and think and look at examples, people's people who actually lived that type of life, who exceeded boundaries, who did these sorts of things. And so Leonard Harris gives us um, David Walker, Lydia Maria Child, um, Henry David Thoreau. Mariah Stewart. Mariah Stewart, right? As, as examples of people who did, I mean, stuff that just doesn't seem conventional. It doesn't seem like it made sense. It bucked the trend. It broke with all of the convention. Um, and, you know, what Harris points out is that and when we do that sort of work, you're probably going to lose some friends. You're probably going to have loss of economic opportunities. Your family may suffer. Your friends and associates might suffer. Um, yeah, so the first step I would say is allowing people to understand that it's a possibility, right? And so that takes educating folks into our own background assumptions, giving people a sense of these are people in the past who have done these sorts of works and this is what it looks like for them in that time period. And then I think the more, well, one of the more pressing bits for us now is just to imagine what it would look like into the future. And so creativity, poetry, imagination is going to be huge. And just imagining if we're not going to go with these set of values and norms, what should it look like? What can, what could it look like? And uh, more and more, that's where my research is going now. I'm trying to write that stuff now. But um, I, I will also say that when I think of coalition building, um, these are some figures you might want to read. So. Um, Maria Logones on uh, complex communication is great. Chris, Christy Dotson on difficult coalitions, difficult coalitions. Uh, Patricia Hill Collins on transversal politics. And Leanne Simpson on what she calls constellations of resistance. All of these people are doing coalitional work from different perspectives and imagining what we could possibly do into the future. Uh, how we could come together as disparate groups and share. I, I would also mention Leonard Harris has good work here too. So, excellent. Thank you so much. And that's that's yeah. a, a you know a really fantastic list of folks to follow up on. And I also think um, you know you named some people there who are also looking at the real difficulties between communities who are who have either by social circumstance scarcity and so on been 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 now mm -hmm. fighting for resources and and for for public recognition so i really think yeah. um you've given a really fantastic list there for folks to follow up on and i might i might just add as we're pivoting into the um to the open q and a i really appreciated you sharing this point about creating communities of love and trust because that also seems to provide the space for people to take those risks, to be able to embody yeah. those those insurrectionist, um, you know, life worlds. That yeah. then, you know, when they do receive uh, that backlash, when they do mm -hmm. receive that mm -hmm. kind of uh, that kind of threat from those who are otherwise uncomfortable or or disturbed by by having their their privilege challenged or what have you, yeah. Um, yeah. that there's a there's a space there for them to to kind of hold them up and continue allowing them to to maintain their sense of, of self worth and futurity yeah. and all those things that are getting that are often threatened when when that happens. Yeah. So I really appreciate that, and I, and I think that seems to also speak to that point about future generations, which I think mm -hmm. seems really nice. Okay, well, we are now kind of pivoting into the Q and A session, and I know we've got a really active chat here, so I want to hand things over to uh, to uh, to my colleague Anthony to to take over from here, and I'll be happy to to chime in when necessary. Great, thank you, Andrea, for handing over, and thank you, well, Lee and Andrea, fantastic conversation. Also, a, a lot of great questions coming in, so I think what we're going to have to do is treat them in a kind of a it's not quite a sort of quick fire one sentence kind of way, but we're just going to have to go through them at quite a rapid pace. I mean, the one I thought I, you know, Lee was just mentioning some great thinkers, Marie Ligonez, 
Patricia Hill Collins, um, Christy Dodson, etc. One person who hasn't come up, and I thought I'd address it to you specifically, Andrea, because she appears in the subtitle of your book, Nos Otros, is Gloria Anzaldúa, who is a name that, again, many people may not have heard of. I was wondering if you could just say how um, her work connects with the kinds of themes we've been discussing today about insurrectionist ethics and beyond. Absolutely. Um, okay, well, yeah, thanks for the prompt. So Gloria Anzaldúa, a queer Chicana, Tejana, um, she called herself a dyke, patlache. There's a lot of terms. Also, the language around even categorizing her was very um, contentious, and she knew it. Um, and so part of her, her life is dedicated to, uh, she was a poet, she was an activist who taught the children of farm workers. So, um, you know, I'm also thinking about that uh, Filipino uh, Mexican farm worker connection there. I didn't know that, Lee. So that's, that's really cool. And especially given the context in, uh, in California and the, the politics at that time with the United Farm Workers, that's, I love, I'm looking forward to talking to you about that. <laughs> Um, anyway, so Anzaldúa worked with the children of farm workers. Um, she's written a number of books, as folks are sharing in the chat. Um, and I saw her work as um, building a, a framework for understanding how um, we act um, and how we can interpret the actions of each other in a way that helps, I think, uh, build on on what Lee's talking about today, which is, you know, how do we interpret one another? Um, uh, in a way that that provides for that depth of context and history and also negotiations with power and negotiations with um, patterns of oppression that then, you know, don't necess necessitate a kind of like immediate, um, you know, uh, a refusal of that person's actions. And so um, you can think through like, this is what difficult, that's what, you know, kind of difficult conflict situations are, is like, we're coming from different needs and different places and different histories and different vulnerabilities, and then trying to figure out how to interpret each other when we're when we're coming from those differences. And so I saw Ansaldua's work as really um, providing some tools that I think started to address how we interpret one another's actions. I also bridged that with uh, Leonard Harris and, and Christy Dotson's um, kind of dialogue on insurrectionist ethics, because Dotson also takes up that question of like, what do we do when we're in really horrific situations and we commit acts that are not obviously like furthering a futurist end? And so she asked that question in her response to, to Harris. So I also saw that as, as an opportunity to kind of bridge some of these dialogues among Harris and Dotson with Ansaldua and then another key figure there is also Maria Lugones, who herself, as we've already mentioned, takes out of that, that, that context of, of complex communication and looking at language specifically and how we can communicate across different venues, which I, I saw just as very relevant. So yeah, I'm happy to, to talk more about Azaldua, but I don't want to take up too much space here. Cool. Thanks, Andrea. That was great. Um, and as I was saying in, when we were chatting before the event, a lot of these names that have come up today have only really come into my orbit within the last maybe six, 12 months. So it's interesting to see. And actually some, someone um, in the, it was more of a sort of comment than a question was saying, hasn't philosophy come a little bit late to such discussions and framing? Seems to me like these kind of things aren't so new in other areas of study. So it's always interesting to see when things suddenly become of interest to, to philosophers. But anyway, moving on to the many questions, there's a really interesting one from Jeremy. Hi, hi Jeremy, thanks a lot for joining. So he's obviously read the blurb to your book, Lee, and says that in the blurb, it mentions new understandings of the person. Would you be able to say something more about what, what you have in mind with this? Sorry, you're um, on mute. Yeah, I was just looking at the back of the book, trying to. Um, okay. So, <laughs> well, I'll rephrase it differently. Though. Yeah, say, yeah. Um, is there anything in your framework that helps us to think about a new way of understanding persons? Um, I see. I see. OK, so um, one of the things that we can discuss is that at very least in the United States, and I would imagine in most places that were colonized, certain groups of people were treated as subpersons, not fully human, not offered full dignity, often exploited and subjugated. And so um, to address inequalities and disparities in social and economic and political situations, we might have to adjust how we understand the person. 
because in many cases, it has been a long tradition of not treating certain people, particularly people of color, as full persons. And so part of this is racialized or ethnic. Um, it has to do with certain types of people um, who don't fit into easy categorized norms. And so um, part of reconsidering or thinking about personhood or humanity is to treat all human beings as human beings and not have certain racial or uh, gendered hierarchies. That, that's great. I mean, it, it um, leads me on to another question, which is from um, Jamie, um, who asks, what does ethical naturalism have, have to say about our moral scope beyond humans? Can we recognize animal resistance and insurrection? So I, I guess he's wondering if you can extend the categories you were just saying in relation to human personhood to non-human animals in your framework. Yes, I, I believe you, we can. Um, I would say, first of all, I believe that Leonard Harris is already working on some of this. Um, and, and so he, he actually has been working on how to extend it and, and create a broader category for what we are considering as persons. Um, I will say for my own work, at least in this book, I've tried to base and stick with human beings. Um, but I do think that this concern would map onto animal liberation. Um, I believe Alice Hank has, has um, concern about this. Um, there is a newer book by a person called Mara Kojukaru um, about animal, animal liberation. And, and I do think there is something to be said about this and how we think about animals and um, what we should afford to, to those other beings. If I could jump in on that as well, I think, I think that's another direction to take. Like, so right now I, I've been teaching some works by Billy Ray Belcourt, a Dishal Cree uh, poet and scholar, and also Margaret Robinson, a Mi'kmaq uh, scholar. And they both have this really interesting read on how the patterns of colonization that have impacted indigenous peoples um, are uh, themselves in, enforced not only against those who were deemed subhuman or those who were deemed uh, outside the category of human. Um, so those animalized uh, peoples who, indigenous peoples, um, but also that the, the, you know, of course we can think about devastation of, of, um, of, of animal species and so on, but also the use of livestock as part of a colonial technique. And so in those cases, we see very interesting ways in which, for example, like roaming livestock was used by uh, uh, British colonizers to then like, like determine the boundaries of land and possession by British colonizers. So we see then livestock both in its commodification and now agricultural, um, underpinnings as part of the process of settler colonization. And there's really there's a really fantastic book, which I'll drop in the chat in a minute, which I think starts to bring these questions together about where, for example, decolonial, anti-colonial, um, and anti-racist work um, kind of overlaps, not in this very like, you know, white veganist, let's all, you know, like, you know, let's do it for health reasons or whatever, but actually brings in processes of, 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 of racism and colonization as part of the project of animal liberation, which I think is, is really important. So I'll drop that link in the chat in just a minute. Thanks, Andrea. So one of the themes that's come up in a number of questions, um, and I'll try and bring them together, is, is I, I guess <laughs> we're sort of going right back to the beginning here of what you were talking about, Lee, with Dewey and, and pragmatism. So I'll just read a few questions and you can pick out one or two themes. So the, the most sort of straightforward version of the question is, what is your pragmatism in relation to early pragmatism? The second one is, could you say a little about how you see Dewey's work? I was really interest in how you saw the relation, relationship between pragmatism and insurrectionist ethics. And the final one on this front is, um, can you say more about the relationship between naturalistic ethics? Um, this is from Tara, sorry, I forgot to say the previous one was from Tonya and this is Tara and the um, second person who's read, I'm afraid, oh, that was from Mark. So. Can you say a little bit more about the relationship between naturalistic ethics and Dewey's empirical stroke humanistic naturalism? Um, so anyway, three questions exploring yes. your relationship with Dewey and pragmatism. 
Yeah, so thank you for the question, uh, folks. Um, I would say if you have a moment, you might read the first chapter of the book. Um, and this is where I set out like my view of Dewey's ethics that, um, you know, so I say when I'm pushed into a corner or when someone says, defend your position, I retreat back to typically something like a Dewey and naturalist position. Uh, it's naturalist partly because I want to stay away from um, supernatural entities if I can, or presuppositions that presuppose like one telos or one ultimate end that's already presupposed. Um, it's pluralistic, it, um, it's constructivist. Um, it, it, so there's a lot of content there to try and explain to you. Um, what I would say, do I'm a Deweyan, if, if in that sort of, if you want to know what type of early pragmatist view I'm looking for or using. Um, and I think that we can understand Dewey as a pluralist who offers us a way to use the big three, utilitarianism, uh, deontology, and virtue ethics, but without... Uh, saying that any of any of them has the right principle right that we can use these as resources when we approach problems and that these sorts of things might be helpful for us when you run into problematic situations um right so um so so i, I also want to say that don't stop there once you get to the last few pages of chapter one, I start to show explain, I try to explain why I have my misgivings with that position and why I do worry a bit about just being Dewey. And I, I think that there are underlying assumptions. There are certain types of um, things that just go through quietly without being challenged that I think we should worry about. And so that's where the insurrectionist stuff fits into it, is that there are some intervening background assumptions, I think, that uh, are smuggled in that we have to worry about if we're ever going to change um, our societies, if we're going to ever address inequalities. Uh, and so that's the sort of thing I'm trying to do. With Dewey, I had always wondered, like, what's the role of capitalism in his in his project? Like, what? Because I think that's like part of the, the trajectory is like thinking about well, what puts the the critique on a kind of global expansion of capitalism. And that that was one I always couldn't answer, but maybe for another show. <laughs> yeah, I think he has a critique of capitalism, but right, um, how, how often or how much he talks about the exploitation of certain groups of people, it, you know, that how, how tied is he to uh, techno-industrialism or, you know, yes, th yes, these lands were taken by certain groups of people. And lots of that isn't discussed. Um, and so there, there are lots of things that seem to just sweep by. And uh, I try to raise some of them as things we at least we should worry about. Um, and so I see the insurrectionist thing as allowing me to step back and sort of ask some questions and challenge some of the basic assumptions. Super. So we're pretty much at time. I think we'll go on for just a couple more minutes. Um, I. Um, I apologize to some of the people whose questions I won't be reading out, Nika, Paul, Caroline. Um, I want to read Ursula's question. I mean, it, it's a big question, and part of the reason I wasn't sure if I was going to ask it is because it probably requires a big answer, and we don't have much time. I'm just going to go for it, and we'll see what we can do in the time we have left. So Ursula says, I agree with Leonard Harris in terms of pragmatism's reverence to a method of intellect, experimental not logic, a faith in democracy offers absolutely no guarantee against patriarchy or racial imperialism. So how can we overcome the quote insurrectionist challenge, which refers to moral philosophies being defective if they fail to support or engage in slave insurrections or express advocacy for other struggles beyond contemporary American society? So big question. Thank you, Ursula. Um. So one of the things is, uh, I guess the goal for me is not to save 
pragmatism in some way, like, like pragmatism is fine and it doesn't need to change. It doesn't need to alter itself. Um, but one of the things that we could do is try to convince people that if you see a regime that is taking groups of people as slaves, we would try and convince everyone that this should not be going on, that we should fight against this, that we should stop this sort of thing. Or that if there are certain groups of people who are being treated as infantilized children or things, objects to be exploited, that we would put an end to that. We would fight against it. Um, I think that's the sort of thing that Leonard Harris is, is arguing for. He doesn't have a knockdown argument or an ultimate abs an absolute principle that's going to sort of stand as the thing that justifies it. But that shouldn't stop us from trying to fight and convince other people to join in with us in this new tradition that won't do those sorts of things, that won't exploit people, that tries not to plunder the earth. Um, and so that, that's the sort of thing I think he has in mind. And, and I would just add too that I think this is a, a question of like also that they're, they're like methodologically, politically, there could not be one argument. Like there couldn't be the, the one approach that would address it. And so I think um, Ursula in your question is also like the reason it invites questions is also like, well, what, what are gonna be those plurality of approaches? And I think part of what I love about, about Lee's book is that invitation to take up a, like the breadth of struggles that people are trying to bring to projects like um, addressing systemic racism or misogynoir or like the combination of the ways in which we see these oppressions take shape. And so in that way, um, there, there couldn't be a unifying feature because there's also like, if we're thinking about necro being, necro being itself is disunified, right? So like that kind of, that kind of systematicity of, of like bringing in multiplicitous ways of, of which is necro being, sorry, is a term from Harris's work that I think also that does show up in, in Lee's work. And that is also something I've thought quite a bit about as, as well. Um, that I think that it requires a plurality of answers, right? You're not, you won't have the one because the many is where the strength is. And it's going to be that kind of, and that is in a way that's, that's like, it, it echoes some things from a democratic project, but it also really builds on what the strength of, of like communities are and the strength of actually social relationships that are built in, you know, things that are very hard to do. And that also require, I mean, back to this point about require us to build networks of trust where we're actually going to be convinced that we care about a future that we both want to, to see enacted. So I think again, that's it's it's less, it's less, you know, it's not, it's not gonna look the same as like a one one solution. So I think it has to be this kind of you know pluralistic and and sometimes seemingly um disunified, but hopefully one that will will at least um bring out the possibilities that we hope to enact. 